Well, here we are with uh, video three for chapter eight, torque and center of mass. In this video, we want to be able to define and calculate torque, uh, understand the conditions necessary for static equilibrium, and understand how to find an object's center of mass, and then also be able to predict what will happen in various situations depending on the position of that center of mass. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Just make sure you got your notebook and your notes ready to go, and you pause and rewind the video as needed. If you were to hold the end of a meter stick horizontally with your hand, and then place a weight on it farther down from where you're holding it, you can feel that meter stick begin to rotate down in the direction of that uh, weight. You can feel the meter stick begin to twist. If you slide that weight further away from the, your hand, then you can feel that twist become even greater. The weight on the meter stick is the same. The force acting on your hand is the same. But what's different is what we call the torque. Torque is the rotational counterpart of force. So force tends to change the motion of things. And torque will tend to rotate things or change the, the rotation of things. So if you want to make a stationary object move, you would apply a force. If you want to make a stationary object rotate, you'd apply a torque. Now just as rotational inertia differs from regular inertia, torque differs from force. Both rotational inertia and torque involve distance from the axis of rotation. In the case of torque, this distance, which provides leverage, is called the lever arm. It's the shortest distance between the applied force, in this case that would be this weight, and the axis, which would be the point about which where you're holding that meter stick somewhere there. We define torque then as the product of this lever arm and the force that produces that rotation. So torque is equal to the lever arm times the force. We abbreviate torque with this symbol here. It's the Greek letter, it's a lowercase tau, spelled T-A-U. And uh, we um, write a tau then like a T with a little curve at the end and then a squiggly top to it. That's a tau. So now take this wrench here for example. You can apply a force to that wrench and then have that force uh, be translated into a torque that rotates the bolt here. So torques produce rotations. A, a torque is very familiar to kids when you play on a seesaw, right? Kids can balance the seesaw even if their weights are unequal simply by moving their position so that they're balanced. So here we've got two equal masses. They're balanced. They're the same distance away from the axis of rotation. When one moves half the distance in, then we get a torque that brings that uh, seesaw down. We add more mass on this side. They're both the same distance from the axis of rotation. Rotates down. But if we move that greater mass uh, closer to that axis of rotation, then it gets balanced. And that's all because torque is equal to the force times the distance from that axis point. If the torques are equal then, which makes the net torque zero, no rotation is produced. Now if you remember we talked about previously that about what's called mechanical equilibrium where an object is not moving, They're in, it's in mechanical equilibrium. In order to get mechanical equilibrium we said that the sum of the forces acting on that object must equal zero. There must be no net force. But now we, we see an additional condition. In order for an object to be in mechanical equilibrium there must also be no net torque either. Now that's the condition that we see here in the uh, seesaw picture where we've got a large force here, small force here, but because uh, this one is half the distance from that point of axis, we end up with no net force and no net torque on them. But so what if, like in this picture here, one of those forces now is hanging then from one end of that seesaw. 
will this still remain in equilibrium? And if so, what mass do we need here in order to get that in equilibrium? Well, the lever arm about any axis of rotation is the perpendicular distance from the axis to the line, line along which the force acts. This will always be the shortest distance between the axis of rotation and the line along which that force acts. This is why if you have like a stubborn bolt or something, it'll be more likely to turn if the applied force is perpendicular to the handle rather than at some sort of angle. Okay, as shown in this figure here, right? This, uh, this force is at an angle. You're gonna get more torque out of it if you apply that force at a 90 degree angle to that lever arm. Also, as the equation um, implies for torque, if you get a longer lever arm, you'll be able to apply even more torque. From here, let's go ahead and move on into center of gravity or center of mass. Now, if you're to toss a baseball into the air, you throw a ball and it's going to follow a smooth parabolic trajectory such as this right here. You put a, throw a baseball bat or throw a hammer in the air and it's not, its path is not going to be smooth. Its motion is all wobbly and it seems to wobble all over the place. But in fact, it wobbles about a very special place, a point on that object called its center of mass. So for a given object, the center of mass is the average position of all the mass that makes up that object. For example, a symmetrical object, such as a ball, has its center of mass at its geometric center. By contrast, an irregularly shaped object, such as a hammer, has more of its mass at a different spot. It's more, more mass at the head of the hammer than there is in the handle. Center of gravity is a term popularly used to express center of mass. The center of gravity is simply the average position of weight distribution. Since weight and mass are proportional, center of gravity and center of mass refer to pretty much the same point of an object. A physicist prefers to use the term center of mass for an object that has a center of mass whether or not it's under the influence of gravity. However, we're going to use the term center of mass and center of gravity interchangeably. So in this photo right here, what we have is a hammer that's been thrown in a parabolic trajectory. And notice that as it flips around, or as it travels through the air, it's rotating about that center of gravity. So it's that center of gravity or that center of mass follows a straight line path just like the ball does, while other parts of the hammer wobble as they move across, move through the air. Since there's no external force acting on the hammer, its center of mass moves equal distances in equal time intervals. The motion of the spinning hammer is the combination of the straight line motion of its center of mass and the rotational motion around its center of mass. Now, Just like this hammer, every object has a center of mass or center of gravity. The center of gravity of a uniformly shaped object, like a meter stick, is at its midpoint. The stick acts as if its entire weight then were concentrated at that point. So supporting that single point supports that entire meter stick. Balancing an object provides a simple method of locating its center of gravity. So the point at which you get any object to balance is the point where you, you found that center of gravity. If you can balance a thing, then you found its center of gravity. So here in this picture, we're showing this, this object being balanced right at its center of gravity. You can also suspend an object and then find its center of gravity. So the center of gravity of any freely suspended object, right? So here is an oblong piece of what looks like wood that's been suspended and attached to it is what's called a plumb bob. So if a vertical line is drawn through the point of suspension, then the center of gravity lies somewhere along that line. And to determine exactly where, where it lies along that line, we only have to suspend the object from some other point and then draw a second vertical line through that point of suspension.
and the center of gravity then would lie where those two lines intersect. So if we take a really close look at this object here, it looks like it's been suspended from several points and we've got several lines that have been drawn and that point at where they intersect is that object's center of gravity. Now keep in mind too that the center of mass of an object can exist where no mass exists. For example, the center of mass of a donut or a ring or a hollow sphere is at the geometrical center where there's no matter. There's a hole in the middle of a donut. That's where its center of mass is though. Similarly, the center of mass of a boomerang is outside the physical structure of it, not within the material of the boomerang. Now the, the location of the center of gravity is important for stability. If we draw a straight line down from the center of gravity of an object of any shape and it, it falls inside the base of the object, then it's in stable equilibrium. It'll balance. It, if it falls outside that base, it's unstable. So why doesn't the Leaning Tower of Pisa fall over? As we can see from this picture, a line from the center of gravity of the tower to the ground falls inside its base. So the leaning tower has stood for several centuries. If the tower leaned over far, far enough so that the center of gravity extended beyond the base out here, it would topple over. So to reduce the likelihood of tipping, it's, it's usually advisable to design objects with a wide base and low center of gravity. The wider the base, the higher the center of gravity must be raised before the object will tip over. Now, as an example of the center of mass being outside the physical mass of, the, of an object, we can look at these pictures here. The center of mass of the L-shaped object is located where no mass exists. In this first one, the center of mass is above the base of support, so the object's stable. In, this sec in the one on the right, it's not above the base of support, so the object's unstable and it's going to tip over. Now objects will rotate because of an unbalanced torque, which is evident in the, these two L shapes here. The, both are unstable and both will topple unless they're fastened to some level surface. So it's easy to see that even if both shapes have the same weight, the one on the right is more unstable. This is because of the greater lever arm here and therefore a greater torque. We'll be looking at several examples of uh, center of gravity, center of mass, and, and do several activities in class. We'll see you then.